Welcome home. You're listening to the 180 Church Podcast with Dr. Sammy and friends. Dr. Sammy D. Kim is a Harvard-trained ethicist and co-founder of 180 Church NYC. He is a Yale Hastings Scholar at the Yale Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics and the Hastings Center, where he explores the inequities surrounding health, immigration, and social policies, along with professional burnout. He is also a regular contributor to Christianity Today. For more information, please visit his website at samdkim.com. Could all be seated? Welcome. Especially for those who are sick at home. I know the nasty flu is going around. Uh, I want to pray that the Lord give you full recovery. And welcome for all of you joining us here today live in person for the last service, in-person service we have through the year. I want to give you a moment to bow with me in prayer, to center ourselves in the rule of life as we become still before the Lord in the silent night in Bethlehem as the second person of the Trinity is miraculously born in a barn to bring good tidings of great joy. We just spent a moment today thinking about the wonder and mystery of the incarnation of Jesus and what it means in our lives. So rather than focusing on us, let's focus on him and his example for what Christmas means. So let's exhale. All our automatic thoughts, ruminating things weighing us down this season. And inhale the presence of God, the promise of Emmanuel, and his everlasting peace. All God's people pray. Amen. So, uh, rather than reading a portion of Jesus Calling today, I want to give you some news. Eddie's outside, I mean, Janice is at home recovering. Even though she gave birth in about 50 minutes, or it seemed like 30 seconds, actually. Uh, um, Noah Brian Cho is born this week. Let's give them a hand. Eddie's outside. Belle, Belle's sleeping, I think, and I think she's going to Sunday school soon. But, uh, yeah, healthy boy. Uh, and I text him and said, Eddie, is that Janice taking a picture of you after an hour of giving birth? And Eddie's like, yep. I'm like... Is she a beast or a human? I mean, is she, I mean, full, real, really astonishing. Also, uh, in other news, Anmin Lee, our very own and our worship team, not yet. <laughs> you know, he uh, received the Sony Fellowship, Marcy Bloom Gotham Fellowship, and it was actually reported in Variety in, in big news this week. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, rare. You know how you get the verification The key to verification on Instagram is actually having major news, the blue check marks, in multiple sources with your name on it. So he's on his way. Yeah. Um, So today, let's put this picture up. I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas uh, in person. And will you just wish someone next to you a Merry Christmas today? We, we haven't done that in three years, so uh, I know we're still not over the pandemic and the flu season, but it's, it, this is going to be our new reality. But um, there are those people who love Christmas, and there are those people who love Christmas, right? I mean, uh, my love for Christmas uh, was inspired, or should I say more accurately, it was installed or drilled by a melodic repetition. And I know I have neighbors that put up Christmas decorations right after Halloween. I mean, and it's like decked out. There's like ghosts, demons, and you know, vampires in their front lawn. And I'm just like, 
where do you get the energy? Like, I have, I have a hard time getting up from the couch. But there, there are neighbors that just can't wait to put up Christmas decorations. And there are those people that have the nerve to start bringing out Christmas songs right after Halloween. You know those people? Those people who put on Mariah Carey, All I Want in Christmas is You. I mean, this is before Thanksgiving, November 1st, and these people bring. And then those crazy hyper, you know, nut jobs Christmas people are those who bring out Michael Bublé, the auto-tone version of All I Want in Christmas, the Canadians, you know. They bring that out. And then when you bring out Josh Groban, that's, that's just... You know, it's over. The aggregation of Christmas is over because it's so good. Okay, so there are people who love Christmas, and then there's my mom. My mom was what you call a Christmas fanatic. And her favorite hymn, you guessed it, was a Christmas hymn called Silent Night. The only problem was she would tell me when she would sing it, Sam, why do they only sing it in the winter? It's so beautiful. And it's the heart of Advent. The heart. Emmanuel. And come on, the interplay between the baby and the mother like me. It fits so well. She would sing it in the summer. She would sing it in the fall. She would sing it in the spring and in the winter. You guessed it. She would sing it with greater vigor. I always wondered why someone born in 1938 who's passed now for over 11 years or so, who with a Buddhist family growing up in Korea fell in love with Christmas so, and how did she fall in love with Jesus? Well, it turns out that during the Korean War and the occupation of Japan, there was a moment when she lost her family. She, she was separated from her parents and her siblings for about a few months. And a missionary couple took her in. and gave her a place to stay, gave her meals, taught her English. And she said, I was the best at English with all the children in the village. I'm not sure. Her English is pretty terrible. And they told her about Jesus. And that was the major catalyst that led to her conversion and to come to Christ later on in her life. And she, in with great nostalgia, would talk about those people. But for Christmas to arrive for my mother, a couple had to travel 6,690 miles from home for the spirit of Noel to enter her heart. 6,600 miles. 90 miles. In the great tradition of Christmas, the first Christmas, this couple were a community of God, a people of God, answering a call from God for their fierce love for God. When we celebrate the Adventists, we often forget the prequel. Tell someone next to you the prequel. People talk about Christmas and Advent, and we like to put up these banners up. Hope, peace, joy, and love. Adventus, good tidings of great joy, which Derek Johnson would preach in world service, just Christmas Day. But the prequel is just as important as the Adventus. It's the exitus. Tell someone next to you, exitus, Latin for departure. Logically, you can't have a arrival without an exit. So the exit exists in context with the Adventists. So it's very important to understand that Jesus, in the first Christmas, or maybe even before time, because Paul tells us in the mystery of salvation that before the foundations of the world, you were adopted. Which means, preeminently, 
Jesus had to leave the throne room of heaven. It's good news for us. But the great departure, the prequel, there's a great sense of loss and anxiety and tension that existed. And we have to also remember the great departure. So then, when we reduce Christmas down from its usual holiday sentimentality and the festivities, and the dust settles and the fog clears, what is Christmas? Christmas is a call. Tell someone next to you, Christmas is a call. But what is that call? Jesus answered it in the Exodus from heaven to the Adventists. Joseph and Mary answered it in the great departure of their lives of living a normal life, a traditional life. They said goodbye to convenience and preferences as the couple who came to witness to my mom to give her a cup of kindness yet yet let all glory to be to, be to Christ that kindness is what catapulted my life today they answered a call and i wonder and this is just contemplation I'm not like, are you answering your call? <laughs> That's not the point of this message. You're like, I'm feeling guilty now. Am I answering my call for Christmas? I don't think so. Because someone like, I know, like Dan, he went to Cabos. That was not answering the call. <laughs> he was trying to torture us while we're suffering here. No, but it's, it's a question I'm asking myself. What is the call? And why did my mother... In the middle of July, sing it, and this is crazy, guys, but in the middle of July today, this past July, I was humming Silent Night. And I'm like, what the heck am I doing? The haunting of Christmas is the call of Christmas. And that's what I want to talk about. What is God calling us to in Christmas? Before time and in the first Christmas. Put this passage up here as we go into the message. Romans 10, 14 says, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? My people of God, and answering a call from God for their fierce love for God. So let's go to this passage here. So, I want to focus on just a few verses here. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is to be born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When you read Matthew through the lens of 2,000 years of Christendom, it almost seems as if Jesus' birth was majestic. When in reality, Jesus was born in a manure, surrounded by manure, and in a barn, escaping the scandal of pregnancy before marriage, what Christmas really was. And so we have this baby embedded in time in scandal as its first destination. So the arrival, the Adventist is actually very, very scandalous and full of tension. And when we read the stories, the angel says, I bring you good tidings of great joy. So the Adventist is great for us. That's what we see. But what, what does heaven, what is the vertical practice see? What is 
if we could push back the curtain of eternity, what would heaven see? What is happening in the exodus? What is happening in the great departure? Well, think about this, and this is theologically complex, but it's rich in the way to understand the call much better for all of us. Well, first, heaven had to give up, in the book of Revelations, their bright and morning star. For the first time since eternity. I mean, eternity is sinuous, right? You, there's no time. There's not a moment in time or outside of time in the time continuum where the second person of the Trinity, which Daryl Johnson calls in, in his book, the book Trinity, at the center of the universe is what? A relationship, which I think might be the most profound statement in any sentence in the history of the world. And he says, at the center of the universe is a community. An eternal community, ever flowing of love. So think about this. In the great departure, God himself is fragmented for the first time ever. The Father and the Spirit utter words that they've never uttered before. And that's goodbye. And it almost feels like a death because they'd never experienced it before. They're a community. They were never Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit like we know. They were just one unit in a fellowship of love. But the grief and tension of departure was the first time. Heaven sees this in the Exodus, in the exit before the Adventist, the prequel. And if you look at the parallel to reconcile the fragmentation of all our relationships on the earth, God himself fragments himself to heal us. Did you just hear that? That's, oh my God, that is crazy. A theological concept that God himself had to experience fragmentation and salvation for us is salvation him to be whole once again. And so what you see here in the very first verse, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a barn, what you see is the idea and the motif of kenosis. Tell someone next to you, kenosis. Greek for emptying. Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, who is equal with God, something to fully grasp empties himself for the sake of others. The greatest altruistic magnanimity to lay down his life for the sake of others. The brokenness of the world he sees, so he breaks himself. The Trinity breaks and fragments themselves for salvation's sake. It's kenosis. Then how does kenosis, the call of kenosis for God himself, as a mirror applied to us. Put this picture up here. So we just came back from Europe, London, and France. And when you, as an American, travel abroad, you forget what it feels like to be an immigrant. And when we arrived at the UK, in the UK with Brexit, and ground, ground soil populism that's brooding there because immigration is very, you know, it's growing in Af parts of Africa and other places. So there, there's great tension in the UK about immigration and public the idea of a public charge, people coming without an overstated visa. And you feel that tension right at the airport. And we, we, we saw... Uh, as we got in line for the non-UK passports, you know, Josh, our youngest, our oldest, uh, refused to go to Europe. Can you believe this? He refused to go to Paris. He's like, nah, I don't want to go to Paris. I want to hang out with my friends. What a dummy. Uh, and, um, you know, and, uh, and so, so Josh is in the line. And, and, you know, Josh is used to, 
you know, pre-check and clear. You know, Josh has clear. <laughs> so when we go to the airport, we don't even, in, in U.S. airports, we don't even need ID. We just go there and they, it's retina display. It's like using an iPhone to open and close the security gate. And then we skip all the people we go, bye guys. And then we go to the front of the airline. They, they go, oh yeah, you don't have to take your shoes off. Just go, just go. And so Josh is used to this. And he goes, are those the peasants over there? How come they don't, they go so slow? And, and now he's getting hangry because we took the red eye over and he's frustrated because we waited for 30 minutes. God forbid, 30 minutes. But I was getting hangry as well. So <laughs> my wife was like, calm down, calm down, just calm down. And there were, you know, a Middle Eastern family uh, that they were checking their, where they were staying at the hotel, uh, you know, why are you here? They show, show me your uh, bank account. Like, I mean, there was this just all types of investigations. And then we got there and literally we put the next picture up. We cleared our lines, that line. This is the Eiffel Tower, me and Josh. We cleared it in three minutes. They didn't ask us where we're staying. They didn't ask us any questions. They just, the person joked with Josh. You seem hungry. He goes, I am, <laughs> but I want to try fish and chips. Is it good? And it, it tells us one thing about who we are, Positional, positionality wise, we're the globalist family, right? Like we look like the globalist family. We have the Burberry scarf on. We have, you know, uh, you know, kid in a sports jacket. We, he has vans on and he looks like an upper middle class globalist kid that's traveling all over the world. And if you look at our passports, it's full with different countries. They know we're not going to stay in the UK. They automatically can tell. And so we're almost 3,000 miles away from home, but we belong in certain sense. We're not a refugee. We're not really immigrants. We're much alike like this first world. And so they recognize that immediately. And we are very different than how Jesus lived his life and who Jesus was when he was born because of the economic difference, because of social difference. And many of you are not refugees. You're in the top 10 percentile. And so that's the disconnect sometimes when we read about this Palestinian Jew that grew up as a refugee, born in Asia, went to Africa to escape the man king's genocide of all kids under one to two. So how do we connect then with kenosis, right? Well, that's exactly why kenosis exists from the prequel, the great departure. Your position, your economic position, your, in many ways, wealth, your potential, all of that is the same. It parallels to heaven. And I often wonder in my own life, how do I live how do I do kenosis? How do I empty myself in a position of privilege, of being a globalist, using miles to travel the world for free even, so rich get richer? How do I connect to the most vulnerable? Do you know? I'm asking questions. It's a rhetorical question. And so what I'm saying is, the call of Christmas, first lesson we learn is what? Is a call to what? Kenosis. And it's not a lecture. Oh, you better empty yourself. You better give up all your privilege, especially, uh, especially your Burberry scarf, and give it to the poor. That's not, that's, that's not my point. It's not a, a condemnation or condemning what I'm saying, the example of the call of Christmas is the king of the universe emptying himself for the sake of others. That's the tradition of Christmas. That's the call of Christmas. I'm not saying <clears throat> that's what we should do. What I'm saying, that's what it is. And the question is, how is God calling us to? 
And it's not about volunteering in the soup kitchen tomorrow and alleviating guilt. What I'm saying is that kenosis has to mark our lives. It must become rhythmic. We must listen to the call of how to lay down our lives for the sake of others. Because we can celebrate Christmas, but that doesn't mean we inhibit its spirit. And this Christmas, for me speaking to you, would not exist if that couple didn't answer the call and traveled 6,690 miles and, and gave the spirit of Noel to my mom. So that's my question to you. Is there a theme of kenosis in your life? Is it all about me getting mine? Is it me about my success, my comfort, my upward mobility? Because that's not Christian. That's the American dream. And there's nothing inherently wrong with the American dream itself if blessing for more blessing. But the Abrahamic and the Christian calling from Abraham to the Advent season is a blessing, blessed to be a blessing. Not me-centered, but others-centered. And that's the question, really, of this season, is how do I live a life that blesses others in my position? And you're like, well, what do I do? Well, let's pray together. Holy Spirit, help us see, help us hear your call. Wherever I am, to lay down my life for others. So that fragmentation could become whole. Because that's what the Trinity did in the Great Departure. So that's the first thing. So let's talk about the application here. Let's talk about how. And this passage gives us the how. When they had gone, verse 13, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Great. So now they're born in scandal. Now they're running for their lives. Okay, so this barn is not good enough. Now we're being chased like cattle. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so so it was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. And if you hear the words, departed there. They had to depart. Again and again. We already said that in the parallel of the great departure, Mary and Joseph had to answer a call to not live the traditional marriage, right? Because they were married and caught up in scandal. So there was no way they could live a traditional life. Although we know them as the royal family now, as uh, they asked that head Celtics coach, I forgot his name, about the other royal family. And he goes, are you talking about Mary uh, and Joseph and Jesus? And they're like, no. Well, well that, I'm only familiar with one royal family, he says. But they were embedded in scandal then. But it shows you about a life, a posture of kenosis. It's about departure. It's about departing sometimes from what is conventional, what is comfortable. Like my preferences. It's the little things. So we have to start small before you become a full-blown missionary and you travel 6,690 miles from here and embody the spirit of Noel. But the point is, Jesus' life was marked and Mary and Joseph's life was marked by kenosis because they lived a life of departure. They departed to arrive to bless the world. But they were always in between. Yeah? Let's move down. So, 
If you've ever seen this movie, it's hilarious. Neighbors. There's a reason why Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because it's really hard. You might find those neighbors that want to talk to you constantly. I have those neighbors. But it seems like one of my neighbors have become infamous at church. Because when people visit me at my house, they go, is that the neighbor? <laughs> Henry, cut this part out of the video. No. Um, I have one neighbor that I would say is neurotically challenged. And <laughs> let me just show you the story. The person who moved was a great neighbor. Well, she was a bit neurotic too. All of us are neurotic. And that's why the Trinity left heaven to make us whole. But, but, but the point is, she told me when she sold the house, she came to me directly and said, Sam, I'm sorry. I'm like, why? What happened? Well, the guy I sold my house to, he's a little crazy. And I said, define little. Yeah, he's basically nuts. <laughs> I'm like, how bad could it be? It was worse than I ever expected. One time, his girlfriend got into an accident with their car, and they parked that car next to ours and said, you hit our car. And I said, why the heck would I hit a parked car? They're like, well, you did. Your wife did. I was like, what? Give me your insurance information. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is like crazy. This, and then I wanted to call my old neighbor and be like, what did you do? What did you do? For a decade, I tried to avoid this neighbor. My wife was like, he's out there. Don't go out there. You know? <laughs> but this, <laughs> this winter, I went out to get the mail with my shorts. And it was like 28 degrees. And he caught me off guard. And this is crazy. It's not an adjective to describe him, it's just a situation that's crazy. He came to me and said, you know, you know what I'm saying? I realized that I am crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm learning that I'm hurting a lot of people around me and all my neighbors. And my girlfriend told me that she doesn't want to see me. And her daughter said to stay away from her because I realized that the way I'm acting, the way I'm living my life is hurting others. And I need to change. And I'm like, in shorts, <laughs> freezing to death. He goes, he goes, I heard you're a pastor. Maybe you can help me. And my wife is like, he's wearing shorts, and I'm freezing to death. And, he's keep go he, and he says the, the same things in 30 minutes, eight times over and over again. Not in a million years would I have ever believed that he would say those things. And he said, I'm, and then he apologized for being a bad neighbor. This is against all my preferences. This is against all my comforts. This is against everything I know. But it tells you, you can have a feud, a feudal tension. You can have the worst neighbor, but God's still working in people. We can say never, never say never. Justin Bieber says, the great Canadian. But... It's true. All of us are stuck this Christmas in our preconceived notions about people and our strange relationships and things that we never think, never we thought could happen. But that's the, the spirit of Christmas, departing from those presuppositions. The comforts, the things that go against our grain, just like heaven gave up their morning star, just like Joseph gave up the comforts of home, just like the missionary that came to take in my mom and give her a cup of kindness that changed her life. So what is the call? What is God calling us to? Very simple. He's calling us to what? To depart. From the neighbors. 
He's calling us to depart. A call to depart. From the average sum of our lives. He's calling us to depart from comfort. One of the things I want to do, and I want to invite you to do it as well, is to experience Christmas before, if you go back home, whatever, immersively. And it's not uh, to do a good thing for people in need. It's, 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 for your own, it's for your own soul. I want to experience what it's like and do it myself. But there are refugees in New York City. And it was a political stunt, but they're here in shelters. And they're everywhere in the five boroughs. And there are places you can go and donate things that could be very similar to your life. Like if, if you're a family, it would be great if you could buy some diapers and donate it. The size of your child. To remember that Jesus was a refugee. That he left heaven for earth for the sake of others. Through kenosis. He departed for the sake of the world. And he even broke and fragmented himself so that the world can become whole. I'm sure there are tons of jackets that you have that you can give for someone that's cold. And I don't want you to donate money because you might have a lot of it, but that's not what I want you to do. I want you to donate a jacket you don't use, shirts you don't wear, sneakers, Andy, I know you have a lot of those. Donate those. And Eddie, too. Actually, all the men in this church have too many sneakers. Some of the men in our church have more shoes than their wives. Lord Jesus, kenosis. If we do this together, maybe with life groups or small groups, and you go directly to donate things, you will remember that that's who Jesus came for. That's who Jesus was. And it'll remind us that's the call of Christmas. The great tithings of the Adventists, but the anxiety and attention of the ex- to Exodus, the great departure. And I pray that you would listen to the call. And I pray the Holy Spirit would whisper what you should depart from. Amen? Let's stand and pray together. (coughs) I can't wait one day to go to heaven and be reunited with this straw thing got to change. <laughs> with my parents. And I can guarantee you the song she'll be singing would be Silent Night. But let me tell you, it will be the greatest sound. You know, my mom always would boast about one thing in her life that she sang at Carnegie Hall with her choir. Today, will you join me in the call to kenosis? Join me in the call to depart and represent Jesus to the world and the power of his love together. Will you lift your hands with me today and say, God, I want to empty my life I want to lay down my life for others. Let's make this our prayer.
so tender am I. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Father, we come before you this afternoon for our last service of the year. Oh Lord, we pray in the tradition of the great departure and the arrival. We wouldn't celebrate Christmas this year, not just, but inhibit it, embrace it, embrace the call it would form in us people who are privileged and blessed to live this life because of God. But a posture to become people of blessing. Not for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of the world. We pray, God, that you would call us to this type of magnanimity and we would grow to become people like Jesus who breaks for others and depart from our preferences our preferences, our comforts, sometimes even our home for the sake of the call. And I pray the Spirit would speak to you this week. Will you bow our heads for the benediction? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. All God's people say, Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll see you next year. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last in-person service of the year. <laughs> um, we'll wrap up 2022 together here. Um, so my name's Sarah. I'm a member here at 180 Church. I'm just going to be sharing some community news before we go into the rest of today's service. 
So first off is how we can give. If you're a member here at 180 Church, we just want to remind you to keep God in the center of your life and finances. You can give at Venmo, Zelle, Chase QuickPay, or PayPal, as is shown on the screen. If you're visiting, welcome. Um, we're so happy you're here and you're our guest, so there's no financial obligation to give. But if you'd like to, you're welcome to do so through the methods above. Next up, we have our Bible reading group, or 180 BRG. And so you can find this on Instagram, and there's going to be beautiful images and captions to brighten up your feed throughout the week. It's a really great way to, for us to keep God's word in our lives and to learn more about God. So we really invite you to follow along there. And next, we have other um, platforms on social media that we're on. So these are all different ways that we can connect throughout the week. We have our Instagram <coughs> handles, the 180 Church that I mentioned, uh, the 180 BRG that I mentioned. We also have 180 Church and 180 Fellowship. We have our Facebook page, Dr. Sammy's Twitter, and we have our live stream, which currently many people are watching on right now. Hi guys. And so specifically with the YouTube is where we do our live streams every week. Whenever you can't make it in person, you can tune in there at 12, 10 p.m. And you can also share this link with any friends and family who um, can't join in person. And so we will also be having our next two services on YouTube specifically. So um, for Christmas and New Year's, next Sunday and the following, uh, we will be meeting on YouTube for our live stream together remotely. And so this is a time where we hope everybody can enjoy some quality time and rest with friends and family and to watch the services with them. So we'll see you guys here in the new year. Yay. Okay. Um, and speaking of Christmas, we're currently in the Advent season, and this week we're focusing on joy. So um, it's a season in the church where we reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ. We're reminded of the meaning of his arrival here on earth 2,000 years ago and the promise of his return. So yeah, we have one more week of Advent, and uh, we hope that you all can just spend some time um, drawing closer to each other and to the Lord. So next up, we have our small groups, which are a great way we can slow down and reflect on what we hear on Sundays in community. We have various groups for different stages of life, um, and you can find the times and places, um, either if you talk to me or to a greeter, we can help you get plugged in. So next up, we have the, our 180 Cafe. So we have our resources up there. Um, you can um, access there any devotionals that might help you draw closer to God on a daily basis and just um, start a practice of prayer that way. And we also have Dr. Sammy's new book, A Holy Haunting, that can help you and others connect with God. So um, wherever they are on their faith journey, we want to encourage you guys to, to share this book with them as it comes out. And please remember to continue to read and post those reviews um, on Amazon when you can. Um, and the prices are listed on the screen, oh sorry, um, for all of those, all of those resources. So um, next up, we have our prayer text hotline. Um, you can access prayer at the email prayer at 180church.tv. So this is a really um, awesome way. If there's anything that you're experiencing in your life that you would like to request prayer for, you can submit it there and a team will be praying in confidentiality for it and for you. Um, and so, yeah, if there's any also anyone that you're praying for in your life, um, you can also share there as well. All right, so next up we have um, all the different ways that you can serve in the community. So we're looking for volunteers in a number of areas. At the cafe, you can come help wake people up both literally and spiritually. Um, you can join children's ministry and help, um, help our littlest members come to know the love of Jesus better. And for any techies, you can come help us build really cool stuff online. And for greeters, um, we want to invite you to invite other people in and welcome them as they come in every Sunday. 